this prophet. If you look at the stories about Elijah, they are found in about six chapters in the Old Testament book of Kings. And yet he ranks as a central figure in shaping and forming Israel's memory. Elijah joins Moses with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Elijah ranks high in importance, but his presence in Scripture is small. If you compare him to the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah, there is no book of Elijah. Nevertheless, the impact of his life is powerful. We know from James in the New Testament, he writes, Elijah was as human as we are. And yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. Was Elijah simply a rain prophet? Elijah does show up in the Old Testament with the announcement to King Ahab that there would be no rain until he gave the word. You probably read the stories. We're going to read some scripture here a little bit from 1 Kings 19, but I'm giving us some background before we get to that scripture. That, of course, shocked the king who thought he had everything under control. But Elijah's name reflects the central conflict with the king. Elijah means Yah is El. Yahweh is God. His name alone challenges the king. Obviously, Ahab should have embraced that reality, Yahweh is God. But he decided to live as if Baal was God. Ahab was influenced by his wife Jezebel, and she was a pleasant company when she didn't get her way. Baal was an alternative nature god, so he should have had rain under his power, shouldn't he? If he was a real god. But Elijah, Yahweh is God, turned that supposed power on its head. Baal had no chance. But people, and this is a truth for all times, people who believe in wrong gods often don't believe the truth, even when they're told. And Jezebel was an influencer. I've read more stories again about influencers in the Stuttgart Zeitung. They had a big article, probably some others too, how young people get into this influencing on video, YouTubes and stuff, and make big money finally, but of course it finally doesn't do a lot of good things for them, long term. But Jezebel was an influencer, and she egged Ahab on to be hard-nosed, and he set himself firmly in the direction of evil. And that meant that all the people of Israel suffered. And I think we know that to be true today. When leaders turn against right living, they bring their nation and the world into huge danger and put everyone at grave risk. We see that around the world right now. It just is shocking when you see the news and know that the war that has and is going on makes everyone in the world suffer. We see this in the Elijah story. He has to go into hiding, but God provides for him. First through natural means, creeks of running water, and then ravens feed him bread. I think that's cool. And then through human means, a foreign woman living outside of Israel, but still suffering from drought because of Ahab's evil also feeds him and cares for him. And you see that God uses all of this to care for the prophet. And time goes by, 
And now in the third year of drought, the conflict comes to an head. Elijah is told by the Lord, go present yourself to King Ahab and tell him that I will soon send rain. That is in chapter 18, verse 1. It's important for the rest of the sermon to see that these years of drought are shaping the situation. Everyone, including the prophet, stands under increased pressure. The prophet emotionally has to really continually lay low. He has to be afraid that they're going to find him. The king and his wife are increasingly aggressive. And Obadiah tells Elijah, the king has searched every nation and kingdom on earth from end to end to find you. God's timing was not the king's, so Elijah was not found by him. But the king is under pressure, and what he sees as the problem is Elijah. I want you to know that that hasn't changed either. Truth tellers. People who tell the truth in our cultures and societies are not welcomed by leaders. They're often sought out to remove them from influencing and telling the truth. The people are actually putting Ahab under pressure to change something. I mean, if Baal is so, pro uh, so powerful, where is he? The king who is bound, who is bowed down to Baal, was so powerful. Why couldn't he do something? So, if you blame Elijah, you see, as the cause of trouble, catch him, get rid of him, and all will be well. They think. Do you sense, as I do, that the length of the pandemic, and if we think about it, we're in the third year of it has created more tensions on all levels of our society. There's a lot of people out there who are aggressive right now, more increasingly aggressive, because they feel this long-term effect of all the pressure of the pandemic. And now things have even elevated more because of the war. So there are many circumstances that influence us that are beyond our control to deal with. We can't simply go back to how we lived before, friends. That's not going to happen. And that's a very hard reality to grasp. Anyone who was traveling this weekend thought everything was back to normal. I've heard many horror stories of things being over full, luggage getting lost, just dimensions of difficulty. Why? Because everyone decided, well, we could all fly again. Well, can we all fly again like we did before? That will be an interesting question. But we have new realities that are going to face us, unknown realities. And you know what? All of this is unsettling. It's unnerving, if you will. It gets on our nerves, all of this. Kenneth Roboff, a Harvard economist, wrote about the world economy right now, and he said, the worst is still ahead. I thought, what a cheery article, by the way. The worst is still ahead. The end of globalization as we know it. Instability in the world. And developing countries are thrown back 10 to 20 years. That's not very cheery, I thought. But these dire uncertainties result in a lot of emotional anguish around the world. People have existential fears. What should we do? How can we survive? Now, we, of all of us here tonight, are not on that critical page. All of us here tonight, I think, have had enough to eat today. Who hasn't had enough to eat today? I mean, you may be still hungry, but you've had enough. Anybody who didn't have something to eat today? Are any of you homeless here tonight? No. We have things really quite good, but many people are asking, how can we survive? And a hundred million people are fleeing their homes because of war and tragedies. And as drought continues, 
People in East Africa are going to ask themselves, where can we go? People are traumatized also by the events that they have gone through. And this includes people from all ages, from children to older folks. They're all traumatized. And all of these traumatized people need help to get over their traumas. And the question is, will we have enough people to help them? So this emotional distress is dominant in our lives and people respond to it in all sorts of ways, including aggression. So what do we do? As the conflict mounts for Elijah, Elijah tells Ahab that rain is on the way, but first there has to be a contest to settle the one question that needed to be settled first. And do you know what that question was? Who is God? And Grace had it on her lips. Thank you, Grace, for whispering that out. Who is God? Elijah is pitted against 450 Baal prophets. Two sacrifices are offered, one on each side. And it was said, the God who answers by fire, he is God. And we know what happens. All the Baal prophets try their best to get their God to respond and their silence. And when Elijah's turn, turn comes, he rebuilds the altar that had been damaged, lays the sacrifice on properly, and at the time of evening prayer, he offers up his prayer, and you remember what happened. Fire came down from heaven and consumed the entire sacrifice. And the people finally get it, and they say, the Lord, he is God. Then Elijah prays for rain, and it comes, and everything turns out well, right? But look what happens in Kings 19, and now we're getting to the crux of the sermon tonight. When Ahab got home, after this Mount Carmel moment, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah, May the God strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you, just as you have killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Bathsheba, a town of Judah, and he left his servant there. And then he went on alone into the wilderness, traveling all day. He sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have died already. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And there he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, what, what are you doing here, Elijah? We all are asking ourselves the same question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah just had the biggest success story of his entire ministry. Think of it. Think of it. All of the waiting in those years of drought. All of the hiding out, all of the being faithful to God had resulted in the affirmation of his name, Yahweh is God. But we are all human beings in this mix of life's happenings. And Elijah thought, now I can rest, the battle is over, we have won. The king will now get it and life will resume better for Israel. There will be relief now and not so much tension. But the story reminds us the mess of spiritual challenge is not cleared up 
with a success story like Mount Carmel. The development of faith is a marathon and not a sprint. Even the issues on many levels facing us today can't be solved by just a clearing up moment and then we get back to living as usual. We're in a climate crisis, even though we've forgotten that in the midst of all the other crises we have. The pandemic is not over, the European war is not over, and we can add on. And the economic consequences are not fully known. So you can add all these things up. So we understand the prophet. His longing for less personal stress does not come. Jezebel's angry, especially about the rain coming without Baal's help, and the prophets of Baal proving to be worthless. She threatens to kill Elijah. Now, the question is, in this situation, has God changed at all? No. God has not changed. Yahweh is still El. Yahweh is still God. But something snapped inside the prophet. All of a sudden, he becomes afraid of someone whose God has just become humiliated. I find that amazing, and yet the Bible is, is truly realistic and honest. He flees. He goes it alone. He even leaves a servant behind. And some people say that was a bit paranoid on his part. Could he not even trust his servant anymore? So he's solitary and alone, and he has no desire to live anymore or be a prophet anymore. He feels wiped out, and he doesn't want to go on. I talked recently to several ministerial colleagues of mine, not living in the Stuttgart area, so don't get nervous about that. But they were both on the edge, both on the edge of not knowing, can I go on in ministry? There's a lot of ministers at the moment who have gone through all of these times of stress and strain, and they're nearly burned out. They're nearly wiped out. Elijah is a prophet, but he's also a human being. And we face the danger always of getting so worn out by all of the issues surrounding us that we simply want to give up. I quit. My brother had his 75th birthday on Saturday. And I talked to him and he said, you know what? I woke up this morning and I felt so old and tired. But what was weighing him down, he's aware, he's a, a retired Anglican minister, Episcopal minister in America. It's for Solomon's sake, I wanted to say that. Uh, he was so weighed down by the things that are going on in this world. And that's the way it can happen to all of us. We can get weighed down. And fears, of course, can create in us a desire to simply run away from it all. We simply want to flee. And many people are fleeing geographically, but others flee within and reject facing reality and blame others instead, instead and get angry with everything. The prophet actually had cared so much about the conflict in his land with the king that he had not done any self-care. Self-care. He got caught in Jezebel's web of threats and forgot that God was holding him. Now you see that's a temptation for all of us here. To get caught in the web of the circumstances around us so much that we forget God is holding us. Everybody can burn out, including prophets and ministers. We can enter zones of depression if everything is questioned, and even the question is raised by many, has anything I have ever been doing really matter? As a minister, you face that question all the time. Elijah needed care. And the good news in our story is that God cared for him. 
First he could sleep, and that's not always the first thing that can happen. But when we're overloaded, friends, what do we need more of? Sleep. Rest. And then God provided him with food. Claudia, good food. And it was fresh food. It was fresh food. Baked bread, not stale bread. You see? God had made an angel come and set up a little fire. It kind of reminds me of Jesus feeding his disciples on the shore. Come, have breakfast, you tired disciples. Hot stones used. The word found in Isaiah where it says, the hot coals touch my lips. That's the same word used here for coals. That same connection to the presence of God, not sending down fire to consume, but heat to bake bread. What a wonderful thing. And a jar of water, the word that is used for the jar of oil that the woman who was the widow had to feed and take care of Elijah. The prophet eats and drinks and sleeps and his physical energy is restored enough so that he can journey to the mountain of God. Now that must have been pretty powerful bread. 40 days and 40 nights, yes, that was super bread. But God meets him with this question, what are you doing here, Elijah? A good question to ask ourselves when lives seem, our lives seem to be falling apart. We need to ask ourselves, what are we doing here? How did we get here? What has happened to us that we got to this place of brokenness or wanting just to give up or stop going on? How did we get here? Elijah describes to the Lord how he felt, and some of what he felt was not completely true. That happens to us in these moments. He wasn't the only prophet left. He just felt like he was. And this underscores emotional anguish. We're not thinking clearly, but we are feeling overwhelmed. Elijah's body was refreshed, but there's more to us than just bodies. Elijah is told to go out and stand before me on the mountain. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And by the way, I was just thinking we need to pray for Bangladesh these days. There's all kinds of water from the monsoon that has flooded the country. And after the earthquake, there was fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. God was not found in all of these natural elements of wind and earthquake and fire. I find it interesting. In fact, I kind of wonder if, if Elijah was a bit traumatized from that fire from heaven experience. I don't know about you, but that would traumatize me. If all of a sudden when we prayed here, fire from heaven fell, I think we'd all be uh, flattened out for at least a good week or so. Because we don't expect that kind of dramatic, powerful impact of God's actual presence. And so God didn't want to traumatize Elijah anymore. But he comes in a small, vulnerable whisper. God wanted relationship with Elijah. And that comes only in something verbal. And it's at this point that Elijah comes out of the cave. And God asks him the question again, um, what are you doing here, Elijah? But this gives us understanding about God's care. When we feel afraid and at the end of ourselves and hide out in a cave, God talks to us in gentle tones. 
We don't know what Elijah was told by God in that whisper. But he was helped enough to get out and go again and face what still needed to be done as a prophet. When we are in emotional anguish and personal turmoil, God wants to care for us. Do you believe that tonight, that we're precious to him? He wants to give us strength, otherwise the journey ahead will be too much for us. So when we close our time together here in the church, those of you at home can imagine, we close with communion tonight and we experience the presence of our Lord and realize He will go with us on our journey. Yes. He will enable us by His Spirit to face whatever is distressing us or whatever confronts us. We have the promise of God's ongoing presence. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.